Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode on my channel, The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopez, as always. And today I have a very good guest for you. It is Dr. Richard Schweder. He is a cultural anthropologist and the Harold H. Swift Distinguished Service Professor of Human Development at the University of Chicago in the U.S. He is the author of Thinking Through Cultures, Expeditions in Cultural Psychology, and Why Do Men Barbecue? Recipes for Cultural Psychology, and editor or co-editor of many books in the areas of cultural psychology, psychological anthropology, and comparative human development. Dr. Schweder has been the recipient of many awards, including a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship and the American Association for the Advancement of Science Social Psychological Prize for his essay, Does the Concept of the Person Vary Cross-Culturally? He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he has also served as president of the Society for Psychological Anthropology. So, Dr. Schweder, thank you a lot for coming on the show. It is really a pleasure to everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I look forward to our conversation. Okay, great. So, let's see. The first question I would like to ask you is, so in your work, you deal a lot with morality, but what is morality from, let's say, a scientific slash psychological slash anthropological perspective? Because as far as I understand it, and I've already had some conversations with psychologists and anthropologists and other people like that about this issue, and it seems that it is not really uh, the thing that people from from a philosophical perspective understand right so i guess i disagree with that right from the start i think that there is no way to avoid the philosophical question if you're going to do a descriptive study of something that is entitled to be called morality and in fact i think those who take that position generally have a particular philosophical stance which is metaphysical we all have metaphysical assumptions, but the assumption they're making is that there is no such thing as moral truth or objective moral goods. And therefore, they're studying something they think they can study without even entertaining or in, including the question of, is that a manifestation of a moral good or a moral truth? Um, if you decide that you're going to study learned habits or popular acceptances or snap emotional judgments that people make and call that morality, it seems to me you're required to say what about it makes it a moral domain. And from my point of view, based on a somewhat different metaphysical assumption, I do believe there are moral truths. I believe there are laws of moral reason and that something's entitled to be called morality if it can plausibly be seen as a manifestation or implementation of a moral truth. So when someone says, I'm disgusted by that, they are not talking about a moral truth. They're simply reporting on their subjective feelings. If they say that's disgusting, if it is a moral claim they're making, then they must be saying that anyone who is reasonable will recognize that they ought to be disgusted by that, and you cannot deny that it's inherently disgusting. So there is a dimension that runs from the purely subjective to the purely objective. And when I talk about moral judgments or the moral domain, I'm talking about social life and people's judgments that ultimately are manifestations of a belief they have about moral truth. And therefore, coming to terms with the concept of moral truth is a preliminary to identifying the moral domain, okay? So a moral judgment is, in this sense, an expression, sometimes explicit, uh, of a judgment that person X ought to do such and such under these circumstances, and the reason for doing it is that it furthers the realization of some moral good or makes manifest a moral truth. I feel that what's happened in, this, in, this, in the area in the social sciences and psychology that is called moral studies is that we now have a kind of Tower of Babel 
in which people are constructing the domain in very different ways. They're really talking past each other and they're not studying a common object. Um, and they're back to studying judgments people make in which they say that disgusts me or that's wrong. But when people say that's wrong or that's right, you have to know in what sense they are saying it. And I, I have been over the years a critic of Lawrence Kohlberg and his scheme for moral development, but there, is, there are many virtuous aspects to Kohlberg's approach. And one of them is that Kohlberg's research agenda is an attempt to study what do people actually mean when they say that's right or that's wrong. And he claims that before you have a true understanding of the moral domain developmentally, you think when you say that's right or that, that's right, you're simply saying that makes me feel good, okay? Um, the, the word essentially says no more than it pleases me or it doesn't please me. Right means it pleases me, wrong means it doesn't please me. From Kohlberg's view, that is not a moral understanding. That's a pre-moral understanding in which you're very egocentric and you're merely talking about yourself. You're not representing anything in your judgment that could be seen as an independent domain of the moral. And he goes on to say, after that, as children develop and get older, right and wrong basically means the popular acceptances of significant people in my world or in my group. So if my mother thinks it's, it's right, then it's right. Or if the government in my country says it's right, then it's right. And for him, that also is pre-moral in understanding. It moves from a kind of egocentrism to a socially shared egocentrism in which my group is then seen to simply declare something to be right or wrong. But you haven't yet reached the moral domain from Kohlberg's point of view until you recognize that there are independent moral truths that the human mind is capable of discovering. And only then do you enter true moral judgment in Kohlberg's scheme. Now, I've been a critic of Kohlberg for a variety of reasons, but I think he's, I share with him this metaphysical stance, which says that the moral domain is about moral truths and about laws of moral reason and about things that could be seen as objective goods. And so from that point of view, I don't think you can really put aside the philosophical question. And in fact, I think those who say that are simply rejecting the idea of independent moral truth and tend to merely think they can do descriptive work, often influenced by a dominant Darwinian theory about what's functional and what survives without really addressing whether or not that which survives is moral. In a sense, if it survives, it's moral, ends up being the Darwinian moral principle. Um, and then defending that is something that you rarely seen done other than assuming everyone wants to survive. But it seems to me that approach actually ultimately makes a travesty of the moral because as long as it produces survival, anything is okay. And the, anything that's okay often ends up meaning behaviors that many people would find immoral for the sake of survival, I'll do this, but they don't necessarily think it's moral because at least in my analyses and the way I think about the moral domain, the folk around the world are cognitivist in their orientation. Very early in life, they at least intuitively believe that when they say something's right, it's more than simply saying, I'm pleasantly affected when I think of it, or um, they, they believe they're in touch with something higher, something transcendental. And I think that cognitivist orientation is a very widespread orientation. Um, so I don't know if I fully have answered your question, but um, I, I do think that um, philosophical work has to be done before you can do the descriptive scientific work. And I think if you reject the domain of moral truth, it's not clear you're studying morality, except to the extent that you're studying people saying I, that's right or that's wrong. Um, but when they say that, they may be saying nothing more than that's what I'm familiar with, or that's my habit, or that's what we do in our group, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was a very interesting answer. But uh, let me just add this to my question. So there are people, particularly the more philosophically minded ones, that make 
the distinction between is, or, is and dot or the is dot dichotomy. And they <laughs> say that, for example, when we describe or talk about scientific facts, that there's not a one to one relationship between facts uh, and moral values, let's say. Uh, but that's from a philosophical perspective, but even from, let's say, a psychological, anthropological one, uh, wouldn't you say that uh, nowadays we're studying the several moral sentiments that we have that were, were the result of our evolutionary history through natural selection and other processes like that, even perhaps sexual selection, I'm not sure, but that the moral systems that we create from a cultural perspective and from a social perspective uh, don't uh, derive directly from uh, those moral sentiments that we have evolved? Um, I, first of all, I would say that it's important to recognize that the moral domain is inherently a normative domain. It's on the ought side. That's what it's about. It's about what you ought to do. It's about be feeling that you're in touch with value, okay? And the value um, that you're in touch with, the fact that you're in touch with values and even have that capacity brings up another metaphysical issue, which is whether you do or do not believe that there's a spiritual aspect to human nature. I believe there's a spiritual aspect to human nature and that the source of morality comes from that spiritual aspect, that you are in touch with something higher that's reflected in your own capacity for free will and your own capacity to even have a sense that there are things of value. The material world doesn't give you that. There has to be something more than simply materialism, okay? So this complicates the conversation, of course, because there will be a big divide between those who are philosophical materialists and ultimately reductionists um, who believe that there really is nothing more to the world than physical particles and fields of force and everything else is just an illusion which plays no part in human action. And those who, um, you can call it dualistic if you want, although that's a little bit misleading, but who believe that um, uh, to understand the moral domain, you have to recognize capacities like agency, free will, and a capacity of the human mind, which comes from somewhere, certainly, and may come from evolution, but nevertheless, it's a capacity which allows human beings to actually discover moral truths. And I do think that those discoveries have an effect on, if you want to say evolution and survival, that's fine with me, but I view it as actually an interaction between the material world and call it spiritual, maybe that's misleading if you have a deeply deistic view of, uh, or, you know, or um, theistic view of, of religion. I'm not trying to invoke a theistic view of religion. This is not about an old man in the sky pulling the strings on human behavior. It's about a quality of human nature, which is related to our ability to choose things, have free will, and be in touch with value. And I think the spiritual aspect of human nature is deeply embedded in those capacities, which I think are uh, a central driving force in human action. And, and yes, it's fortunate that doing what's moral can be functional, okay? Uh, but simply because it's functional doesn't make it moral. And I would draw that distinction. On the is ought distinction, um, you know, I think that one of the amazing things about ordinary language, especially the language of the social order, it, um, it, it, it makes the transition from is to ought easy. Um, you say, she's his mother. Okay, that's a description. That's an is comment. She's his mother. Now notice, once you just put the world under that descriptor, you put a person under the description, his mother, all sorts of briefs and obligations follow from it. You, you can reasonably say, Therefore, she ought to care about his strep infection and the 103 de you know, degree temperature that child has. For you go from is, the identification of someone as a mother, to ought, the obligations that follow from it. And there's no problem doing that. It's an easy thing to do. 
And then, of course, you have to specify, if you want to be philosophical and reflective about it, why it is you think that ought should follow from it. And then you're into the world of, you know, you should protect the vulnerable who are under your charge, which is one of the laws of moral reason. Um, anyone in the world should protect the vulnerable under their charge. And if you then say to someone, well, why should you protect the vulnerable under your charge? At that point, you do get to what John Hyde has labeled dumbfounding, because people will look at you and say, I have to explain to you why you should protect the vulnerable who are under your charge. There's nothing more to say about it. It's self-evident, okay? And they're not saying it because it's an emotional reaction. Okay? Dumbfounding, in my view, is not about emotional reactions. It's about coming to the limits of reason where something is recognized as obvious and a self-evident truth and nothing more needs to be said about it. That's why you're dumbfounded, because there is nothing more to be said. And if someone said, well, I'll tell you what, I don't think, I think you should harm the vulnerable who are under your charge. You'd look at them and think, this is where this person, they don't understand my language. You probably, you'd say, you don't really understand the language we're using, right? Here's what these words mean. Do you really understand it? And if they continue to say, yeah, I understand it. And they convinced you of that. And they went on to say, yeah, you should harm the vulnerable who are under your charge, um, who you're there to protect. You would think they're out of touch with moral truth and reality. Mm -hmm. So I do think that the that everyday language, the language of status, role, and the way in which we describe what is in the social world has internal to it um, the ought normative side, and the moral domain is about that normative side. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> No, no, that, that was all very interesting. Okay, so let's get a bit more into your work specifically. So in your work, you identify three main moral foundations, autonomy, community and divinity. So could you please talk a little bit about each of them and to what aspects of human sociality and personhood is each of them related to? Okay, so... Yes, I, I believe that the moral domain is broader, more encompassing than the approach to morality or the domain as it has been typically defined in, let's say, forgive the expression, Western psychological research on the moral domain, which I think has largely been restricted to what I call the ethics of autonomy and has focused on concepts like Oh, harm, rights, justice, equality, um, and autonomy, of course, liberty, so um, or self-determination. And I believe that that I I have expanded the domain based on empirical research on the way in which people make what I view as credible moral judgments around the world to also include what I call the ethics of community and the ethics of divinity. Central to this tripartite scheme, this big three, as it is sometimes called, of morality, is a focus on conceptions of the self. Okay, And that's what the, the scheme is organized around. The notion is that the ethics of autonomy highlights an aspect of the self, let's call it the self, as a preference structure. Individuals have preferences. There are things they want. And the ethics of autonomy basically focuses on individual preference realization and organizing a social world in which people are free to have the things they want and to pursue them as long as they don't interfere with the things other people want. Okay. And so you have a world built out of a kind of individualism with people coming to think about what their preference are, preferences are and having the liberty and resources to non-interference in their pursuits to realize their preferences. Um, I believe that the ethics of autonomy plays a very large part in my subcultural world and probably in the subcultural world of many academics in Europe, North America, and so forth. You see it early in life. You know, when you watch an adult in my cultural, subcultural world walk up to a two-year-old child and say, what do you want for dinner? You are communicating 
to that two-year-old that having wants is important. And you are showing that others, including an adult who has a lot of power over that child, is going to defer to what that child's preferences happen to be. And you then cultivate a population of individuals who are always thinking about what they want and wanting to have the things they want and are very aware of the idea of being free to pursue them and not interfering with other people's ability to do it. And conflicts, of course, arise that have to be adjudicated when two people are pursuing the same thing and there is a conflict between having it. But it's a world of preference seeking for individuals. That's the ethics of autonomy. And its regulatory concepts are things like equality and not harming others, um, um, freedom, and things of this type. The ethics of community and the ethics of divinity each have their own aspect of the self, which gets privileged or highlighted when you develop that kind of ethic. The ethics of community is built around central regulatory moral concepts like duty, hierarchy, interdependency, loyalty, um, and it assumes a self that is a status bearer, is, is a role, is a position typically within a community and typically in hierarchical interdependency with other roles. So you're the you know, first violinist in the orchestra, you're the conductor of the orchestra, you're the captain of the ship, you're not the captain of the ship, you have a different position on the ship, you're the professor, you're the student, you're the parent, you're the child. Each of those are roles and people think of themselves in terms of what roles they occupy and their sense of who they are is tied up with the idea that they have a duty or obligation to realize the briefs that go with the position they're in. And they recognize that these are generally interdependent, complicated role systems of in-groups. So it, it requires a distinction between who's in my family and who isn't, who's a, who's a member of this orchestra and who isn't, who's an officer in this, on this particular ship and who isn't. In-group, out-group distinctions become very important as does hierarchical interdependency and notions of respect and deference and loyalty and protection and all these kinds of moral concepts get highlighted. Um, and then there's a third domain which I call the ethics of divinity and there the central notions are concepts like purity, sanctity, pollution, cleanliness, the sacred order's relationship to the natural order. And it's built around a concept of the self as spiritual. When I was talking about the spiritual aspects of human nature, the idea is that every individual has in them a sliver of the divine. Um, the, there's a beautiful metaphor that Gnostic religious traditions have in which you imagine there once was a kind of unity which is represented by this beautiful crystal ball and it drops and shatters and each of us has one little sliver of that original unified spiritual crystal ball and um, the notion there is that we recognize each other as persons because we see in the other that what shall we say that spark of the divine that ability for free will that recognition of value that sense of being in touch with something transcendental so in the community that I've worked in on and off for many years in India, which is a Hindu temple town and pilgrimage site, the ethics of community and ethics of divinity are highly elaborated. It's not that there isn't an ethics of autonomy too, but I would say that that's not the privileged domain. And people are very conscious of living up to the briefs, having the duty and obligation to be the best to live up to the telos of the position or status they have and they spend a lot of time thinking about the sanctity of their body what they eat and how the food is prepared eating ends up being a kind of offering to a deity in you there's a kind of imminent notion of the divine every per there's a world soul and there's a personal soul and they're seen as extensions of each other and many activities 
turn on highlighting the notion of purity and pollution or of sanctity and, and desanctification. So that's the general scheme. The notion is everyone's got all of them, but they end up being implemented and privileged or made central in different degrees in different traditions. And those are manifest in everyday practice. I mean, just looking at a family meal in the United States and the contrast between food preparation and consumption in a secular community like the one I live in in Hyde Park around the University of Chicago versus how it operates in the temple town in India, um, you can't help but see different manifestations of these three types of ethics. Now, I want to emphasize that this is about three different concepts of the self. And the big three has been expanded and, tr and um, interpreted in somewhat different ways and, um, and used for different purposes. So for example, if you move away from having it be a theory about aspects of the self to simply being about or only being about those moral regulatory concepts, then there are many regulatory concepts and you can go ahead and you try to examine where do they come from? Are they innate? You know, uh, what's the, what, what, how do they evolve? That's a somewhat different question that's being answered than the big three is meant to answer. The big three is about selves. And um, I believe that every individual has multiple aspects to their selves. There is a self that is the preference structure self having wants and pursuing them. There is a self that is the self as having a status and standing within a community that's usually a hierarchically organized one with in-out distinctions. And, and your sense of dignity comes from performing that role or that brief as best you can. That's its telos. Everywhere you go in the world, in every language, you're going to find role and status concepts. And every person, I think, intuitively, even if they're an atheist, okay, even if they reject a theistic view of, 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 of the world, I do believe they intuitively have a sense of this spiritual element in themselves. They may intellectually, philosophically want to deny it. They may become philosophical materialists and have a system which says we have to reduce everything down to physical particles and my sense of free will is merely illusory. Yet, when they live in a social world, they are exercising agency, they have a sense of value, they are making judgments which reflect that, and um, the degree to which um, issues of sanctity and purity are salient to them may vary enormously and do, but you will notice them behaving in ways sometimes which reflect purity concepts as well. They may go to a funeral come back to meet with a family that's mourning and wash their hands, okay? Um, and there's a way in which cleanliness is next to godliness, that expression manifests itself in all sorts of ways in our lives. So that's a brief primer on the big three. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And you refer to very interesting things and I have several follow-up questions to all of, the, of what you just said. But the first one perhaps is, uh, so at a certain point you refer to the fact that all people and all societies uh, share these three moral foundations. All of, all of people uh, have them. But uh, so would you say that they are innate but then according to the environmental conditions and when i'm referring to the environment i'm including of course uh, cultural conditions then people are led to put more emphasis perhaps in one of them in comparison with the others like for example as we do in the west that he, that we value much more uh, things related to autonomy than perhaps community and divinity? I would put it exactly that way. I think that, um, you know, let me step back. Um, there is a philosophical position which I've sometimes, a tri which I've sometimes talked about, which I call Confucianism. And that's not to be confused with Confucianism. This is a philosophy of both research and I think of life, which has a small set of central maxims or principles. Um, the first 
maxim of Confucianism is the notion that the knowable world is incomplete if seen from any one point of view, incoherent if seen from all points of view at once, and empty if you try to see it from nowhere in particular. Okay. So the choice in life and in scholarship is between incompleteness, incoherence, and emptiness. That may sound like a somewhat tragic choice, and I suppose it is, but we are embodied, we're situated in a time and place. We can't be everywhere at once. Um, so I think that is the tragic choice. And in the choice between emptiness, incoherence, and incompleteness, I can never choose incoherence. That's the end of all intelligent conversation and attempt to understand things. Emptiness is something that some scholars adopt. People who call themselves structuralists try to get to a distance on things so that all that's left is abstract structure or mathematical structure, but it's a very dehumanizing distance. And I always opt for incompleteness and then try to stay on the move between different points of view and try to remember what I learned from seeing the world from that stance, seeing the world from that stance. So I, that's where the variety is. But with back to your question, the second principle of Confucianism is what I call original multiplicity. I think you come into the world complicated. You're not a tabla rasa. Um, you have a deep past that's already available to you at birth. And I think it is the case that of a vast set of things you already have in somewhat structured form, only a subset gets carried forward in any particular tradition. So you meet the tradition. That is the environment that you were talking about in this broad sense. It's like a resonance system, a much broader set of potentialities and structures come into the world. They're already there. They come from deep past. I'm neutral on how, I don't think people are very good at explaining how they got there. I think that's a mystery. I don't think that evolutionary hand-waving fills in how it got there other than saying it must, it's, you know, it's a deep time and selection is not to me an adequate explanation of the particulars involved. But nevertheless, it's coming from the deep past. It's already there. We inherit it in some sense. People who believe in reincarnating souls in India have the same kind of general theory. You come into the world an old soul, not a new soul. You have some kind of memory of past lives, which is sort of like taking an evolutionary view on things and where they came from. But then only a, a small subset or part of the full array gets carried forward, is privileged, is institutionalized, is named, is labeled, has theories about it in the particular historical tradition you're part of. A very nice analogy to this, which I sometimes use, has to do with phonetic detection in language. And there's a fair amount of research on infants' capacity to hear language-specific phonemic distinctions. Like in North Indian languages, there is a distinction between an aspirated and an unaspirated T sound. So in English, at least, when you say T, if you, if you say to yourself T, and I know you're multilingual, but if you just say T, I think you'll notice that your tongue goes to the roof of your mouth somewhat forward. In the North Indian languages, they have a different distinction that's meaningful in the language between T and T in which the tongue is either more forward in the roof of the mouth or further back. That's a distinction that doesn't exist in English. And English speakers have a hard time learning the phonetics of North Indian languages because they can't hear or produce reliably that, that distinction between t and t when they're speaking words in Hindi or Oriya, let's say. Um, it turns out that an American 18-month-old hears it. And you, there are nice experiments showing that if you habituate an 18-month-old to a particular sound and then introduce the Indian distinctions, the child notices it. And that's true for 18 months old, no matter what culture they're in. They can hear the language-specific con contrast in all human languages. Their own parents can't hear it, okay? But when they, and it's like they have a, the full complement of phonemic distinctions, like a wiring diagram, is available to them at birth. Then they learn their mother tongue, like English, let's say. And 
it it gets peripheralized the capacity okay so then now all of a sudden it's lost these are called maintenance loss models in developmental psychology you have more that's there at the beginning and then part of it is maintained and part of it is lost and i think that's what you've described essentially in your question to me now one of the interesting things about this is that there may be a critical period so that let's say an american child is living in north india for the first 3 or 4 years of their life and they've actually started to learn a north indian language and then they go back home to america and they lose the language but as an adult they want to learn a north indian language they somehow by activating the use of it early in life have a much easier time picking it up as adults but the general picture is we have a lot that's there early in life and only a subset gets carried forward i don't think what's peripheralized totally disappears i in my own life experience doing field work in india after being there for a long time after trying to master their words and concepts for things after seeing and participating in their practices i begin to activate some of the moral judgments and um you know and um feelings even that the natives have quote and quote the natives have and i think i can do that because they've been there all along peripheralized in my own psyche and now i've done enough of the work to get them online or center stage and they start operating you know i start worrying about karmic things that i didn't worry about before I think I start thinking about my god you reap what you sow. I mean is the past going to catch up with me? I mean things of this type which were may not have been active but they become active. Mhm. Okay. okay, very well. Uh and uh, what do you, what would you say Jonathan Hyde has done when he expanded your moral foundations and I think that at least in regards to autonomy and community he subdivided them into two others that is he subdivided autonomy into care slash arm and fairness and community into loyalty to the group and respect for authority D divinity I, i mean he, he simply changed the name i think to sanctity slash purity and then he also added liberty for <laughs> for the libertarians in this case but what what would you say he did there when he expanded your original moral foundations well i think that, first of all i think that he's done a tremendous job it's a nice contribution to have first of all made the scheme highly visible and applied it uh in a very important domain which a lot of people care about um there was another former student of mine uh, you know john was a postdoctoral student of mine um and by the way alan fist too was one of my first students many years ago who i know we're going to probably talk about alan fist scheme as well um and there are several other students who've done great work on the moral domain joan miller being one Nancy Muke being one <clears throat> Lena Jensen who I mentioned because <clears throat> she early on started applying the scheme to liberal versus conservative kinds of distinctions in in um Protestant religious traditions she did her own PhD thesis applying it to um religious fundamentalists uh, or evangelical Protestants and liberal Protestants to see which of the big 3 were privileged in the way they they addressed common moral dilemmas and problems and i think um what john has done and he's quite explicit about having subdivided the domain to create five domains originally um is try to find a way to merge the the big 3 with evolutionary psychological approaches and especially to try and think about innate foundations and the functionality of those concepts In doing that however of course he's moved away from the underlying logic of the scheme which was to characterize selves so he's not trying to come up with six different selves he's trying to come up with six different fundamentals for moral judgment um and then to link it to theories that have to do with evolutionary adaptiveness and so forth and i view it as a tremendous contribution but um and it it's inspiration as he notes came out of the big 3 um 
but if you're interested in cells, um, I think there's a difference between moral foundations theory and and um, the big three. Um, I mean, that's my main comment. And I would also say that um, I, I think that the libertarians are interesting because it's hard to classify them on a left right distinction uh, in the least in the United States political rhetoric or discourse. Um, you know, are they conservative? Are they liberal? There are many ways in which li libertarians who are sometimes called neoconservatives are pretty similar to philosophical anarchists. And I, I, I emphasize philosophical an anarchists. I mean, people who believe there are only very narrow areas where we need a state regulating society and they prefer limited, just as the libertarians, there's a preference for very limited government um and liberty ends up being a central concept so there was some need if you're going to think about the political spectrum to figure out what to do um with the libertarians and that may be one of the inspirations for introducing it as another foundation i think you know i would put liberty in the ethics of autonomy i think autonomy is about self-determination and the liberty to have the things you want um so i would keep it there i wouldn't differentiate it out but the difference in approach, I think, basically turns on purpose and objectives. Um, my objective was characterizing theories of the self, and I think his was getting to foundational moral concepts and then trying to see how evolutionary psychology and moral psychology and cultural analysis all might be brought together. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's one of the distinctions, as you just said, but um, perhaps the, that last part about the libertarians and his need to include a new moral foundation that is liberty just because uh, just for them <laughs> just for them to have this moral foundation uh, wouldn't you say that perhaps uh, that might indicate the, that he, he was a bit too focused on how uh, on how people that were part of certain political parties or political tribes uh, were constructed in terms of their moral foundations. And I, I mean, that, that could, could have been why in the end included uh, the moral foundation of liberty. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think I would say he was too focused. I would say that what he was trying to do was to apply um, a scheme that both broadened one's understanding of the moral domain um, in part so that you could recognize people who were members of different factions in a society as morally sensible people who might do things for good reasons. Um, and he did that by applying, you know, a existing scheme that he was elaborating. So I don't think it, it was there was a problem with doing it. I think you just have to view it as one particular application of a scheme. And once you get into wanting to try and help, let's say, Americans, for example, who are often highly parochial and living in bu political bubbles of their own, yet are coexisting in a single polity or society, you're trying to help them um, have the capacity to step into the world of the other and to um, have the moral language for being able to do that and recognize, as I said, the other as a morally sensible person who does things for reasons. So he was articulating the underlying re reasons. And I think that probably people recognize liberty as a good. And, um, and he was, I, I, you know, I, I, this is somewhat speculative because I, you know, I'm, um, I'm not John Haidt speaking for John Haidt. I'm just an observer of, you know, the elaboration of the scheme and its uptake. Um, I think he um, came to recognize that when he talked about, you know, the liberal left versus the conservative right and started characterizing which of those moral foundational principles seem to be used more or less or exclusively or more comprehensively, um, because libertarians were called neoconservatives, 
rightly or wrongly, it's, prob it's probably a very misleading title because they basically are 19th century liberals invoking the liberalism of the past, but they're called neoconservatives. So if you start saying, here's what happens on the conservative right versus what happens on the liberal left, and there you have a group called neoconservatives who don't look like what's happening on the conservative right, you have to deal with it somehow. And um, it's a recognition that there actually is another moral foundation. And it does suggest that it's not so simple to have a left-right distinction. Um, I mean, I, you know, long ago, I, w I myself was talking from time to time about what I called, you know, the liberal virtues and the conservative virtues and notions like loyalty and respect for authority, um, you know, things of this type in-group, out-group distinctions, the ethics of community type notions were ones I did associate with more conservative thinking and um, equality and big emphasis on harm and equality um, I was associating with the liberal left. And I think it's um, not unreasonable to go in that direction. Um, I don't think that John's scheme should be seen as merely a reflection of parochial political issues in the United States. I mean, I think it has much broader application, and I think what he's done is applied it to current um, tensions and conflicts within American society, and perhaps more broadly. Um, and um, one of the reasons I think it's be gotten a lot of attention is because of the currency of those issues, and that's just fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well. Uh, so, uh, I've also interviewed on my show Dr. Oliver Scott Curry, who is an evolutionary anthropologist that also does a lot of work on human morality. Uh, and I mean, it's very interesting that when I asked you to talk about your three moral foundations, you refer to the fact that the the primary goal of them was to understand how people elaborate or sort of elaborate their sense of self and that they not really exhaust all the possible domains of human mor morality. And I, I've just now referred to Scott Curry because at a certain point in our interview, I talked about uh, his periodic table of ethics that include things that, for example, Jonathan Haidt doesn't include in his moral foundations. And two big examples that he gave me were uh, kin selection and reciprocal altruism. So, I, I mean, do, do you agree with this view uh, and that uh, there are probably other domains of human morality that we still have to discover? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, focusing on kinship, focusing on reciprocal altruism, um, I don't think reciprocal altruism is something that's absent from the moral foundation scheme or my own scheme. Um, but I think that it's important to recognize that not every approach is about everything. These, the approaches we're talking about are about objective moral goods, not about the pragmatics of application of these systems to any particular domain of social interaction, like the family um, or any other one. So I think it's a very important project to go ahead and try and identify these domains in which ethical notions or moral notions make themselves manifest and how they're organized. Um, that's an important contribution. Um, I think that what's missing perhaps both from the big three and uh, the moral foundation scheme, um, I mean, it's, I, I, it's not missing in any um, critical sense because the pragmatics of applying these things and specifying how family dynamics works or how any or how politics works or how any other domain works is um, exactly what you'd like from an application point of view. But perhaps what has been understated is even deeper laws of moral reason or rules of moral reason. And um, and I think that, you know, being gratitude for gifts or for patronage shown to you and the reciprocal altruism that's involved in that would be one of those rules. 
And there are many other laws of moral reason, which I view as, you know, universals. I should say, by the way, just to, um, to avoid misunderstanding, I've noticed over the decades that I'm, my own work is sometimes viewed as relativism. And um, I don't view myself as a relativist. I view myself actually as someone who believes in universalism without the uniformity. That's the slogan I would use. And I do think there are deep rules of moral reason, which are universals, like treat like cases alike in different cases differently, or you should protect the vulnerable who are under your charge, which I mentioned earlier, or you should reciprocate gifts received, or um, you know, if you see someone in great distress and you can help them at little cost to yourself, you should do so. Um, or, you know, given a choice between two different goods, choose the greater one. I mean, there is a whole set of things of this type, which like logical principles um, or mathematical principles, I think are deep and have are universal in that sense. Um, it's just that the application of any of these principles um, always has other supplementary concepts and local knowledge that produces divergences in people's judgments about cases. And so, you know, the same deep principle may be behind the judgment in the United States that the family estate should be equally divided between daughters and sons. And, um, and that same principle may be operating in an Indian community like the one I work in in which they do not believe you should divide the family estate be equally between daughters and sons. And both of them are respecting the same principle, which is treat like cases alike and different cases differently. Just that one of them has a fair understanding of the relevant differences that lead to the sons inheriting more than the daughters because of the kinship system and the morality of the kinship system, because Daughters are going to marry out and move into their husband's families and take charge of those families. They're going to change their kinship affiliation. They're not going to have responsibility to take care of their parents in old age. The sons are. So once you begin to understand the local kinship structure and how it operates, you can see how anyone might agree that, yes, you know, we, you should treat the, the inheritance shouldn't be equally divided because the responsibilities are not equal and you're just treating different cases differently, which is compatible with the principle of justice. Um, so abstract principles that are universal, by the time you come down to historical situations in particular groups and local contexts, often result in very different judgments about what the right thing to do might be in that circumstance. And that's where the lack of uniformity emerges. You end up having a set of abstract moral principles like the ones I mentioned. And by the time you get down to the reality of their application, enough local knowledge leads you to divergent conclusions about what the right thing to do is. And that's one of the reasons it's important to step into the so-called native point of view. Because if you understand enough about the local situation and how it's faced by those who are engaged in it, you might come to see how what they're doing is the right thing to do, even though it wouldn't be the right thing to do in your world. And one of the great responsibilities of anthropology, I believe, is, to, you know, this is almost a hackneyed comment, but I believe anthropology's mission, at least in part, is to help people overcome ethnocentrism, or at least the dark side of ethnocentrism. There's a light side to ethnocentrism too. Everyone has to be ethnocentric. If you're gonna live in any local world, you have to take the perspective of the world you're in and be fluent at being ethnocentric, which is just being a native in your world. But when you meet other worlds, if you look at their world and react to it as though what they're doing is happening in your world, that's, a, that's the dark side of ethnocentrism. You're assimilating their world to your world and you often get them wrong and you often end up making judgments that demonize them because what they're doing elicits in you strong feelings of revulsion or disgust or indignation because you are reacting to it as though it were happening in your world without fully understanding their world and why when it happens in that world, it might actually make moral sense.